Well, good afternoon, everybody, and we'd like to welcome you to our second week of Baking with Ancient Grains. And today, our guest speaker is Carrie Eberly. She's from CEREC, which is the Sustainable Agriculture Research Extension Center located near Lingle. And um, CEREC is doing a lot of the research on the ancient grains. And Carrie is one of the agronomists. So she's going to visit with us today about the growing part of the ancient grains. And then we're going to bake some spelt banana bread. So I'm going to turn it over to Carrie. And if as we're going along, if you have questions, um, either type them into the chat or um, just break in and, and we'll try to answer those questions as we go along. So we'd like to thank Carrie for joining us and we'll turn it over to her and she's going to teach us all about growing. Yeah, well, thank you for having me, Denise. Um, can you hear me okay? We can. You can, perfect. Um, yeah, as you said, I am, um, I work out of a research station in Lingle. Um, I am a cropping systems agronomist, so I focus my research on understanding um, alternative or improved crop rotations for Wyoming farmers and trying to find additional revenue sources for um, our farmers to help them as our markets bounce around. A couple years ago, um, Caitlin Youngquist, who was on live with you last week, and another collaborator, Tom Folk, um, came to us with this first grains project. And it was really interesting because one of the things Wyoming farmers are really good at is growing small grains. So we have a lot of wheat production and we have a lot of barley production. We have the equipment for it, we have the tools for it, um, and we have a lot of the knowledge that comes around with um, actually producing those crops. And the appeal of these ancient grains or the Wyoming first grains is that it's a unique higher value um, grain that our farmers may be able to produce that wouldn't require a lot of changes to their system, um, but could potentially fill in some of those revenue components. So what we wanted to understand and, and figure out is how these grains grow and perform in Wyoming. Um, we know we can grow wheat, we know we can grow barley, but can we grow spelt and emmer and einkorn? Um, so over the last few years, that's what we, we have been doing. We have partnered with five different farmers around the state and then the three research stations here in Lingle, um, the Sheridan Research Station and the Powell Research Station. And between all of those locations, we've been growing the different crops. We've been using some different fertility and irrigation schemes to grow them. And we're really just interested in figuring out where we should be producing them, how we should be producing them. And then also there's this component of figuring out the problems with producing them. Um, so anytime you grow a new crop, there's always going to be some hiccups in the system. Um, so it's been really interesting. We have encountered some problems. So I don't know if uh, Caitlin mentioned it last week, but these grains are, um, they're not free threshing. So that means when you harvest the grain, um, that seed comes in this tough papery shell that needs to be removed before you can actually access um, the grain. So our farmers have been harvesting this hulled grain and then it gets delivered to our processing facility and then we need to clean it and separate out the grain. So for you to get the spelt that you're going to be cooking with today or baking with, sorry, you're making banana bread, that's baking. Um, we basically go from maybe a thousand pounds in the truck to 400 pounds of actual grain. And the rest is lost in that processing step to remove those hulls. And then we have some extra loss with it. Um, so it's a really complicated project because we're figuring out from the drill, from getting seed in the ground to getting it out of the field, 
um, to processing it, to getting it delivered to you guys, all the unique nuances and steps to actually producing this crop. Um, so I'm not sure, do you have any specific questions about the crop or? And Carrie, you might tell them what's behind you. Oh yeah. So behind me here, I'm gonna step out of the frame. Um, I'm not sure how well you can see it, but there's a, you can kind of differentiate the two halves of the field. So this is one of our farmer's fields in, um, I believe this is our Sheridan farmer. And we have I'm Emmer growing on this side of the field and Spelt growing on this side of the field. So you can see it's really nice and lush and green. One thing that we see is these, these plants can be a little larger than what we see with a modern wheat or a modern barley plant. So they have more vegetation to them. Their, their leaves are a little bit thicker and more robust. Um, they also haven't gone through the breeding to have a short stature. Uh, so with small grains, if they get really tall, you run into issues with that crop falling over in the field and that makes it really hard to harvest. Our modern varieties, one of the things that's been bred into them is for them to be shorter so, so that they don't fall over in the field. So with ancient grains, we don't have that same amount of breeding because they are ancient. <laughs> and, and so that means that we have to um, manage some of those characteristics through either less nitrogen application or uh, less irrigation to try and help find a balance between supporting good yield but minimizing excessive plant growth. That's gonna cause problems for the farmers. So are they turning it into straw? Like after they harvest? We have, that's a great question about turning it into straw. Um, that has been brought up a lot. Our, our animal scientist at CEREC actually has asked about using spelt specifically as a forage crop because it is so green and lush. Um, we have not specifically started looking at using it for straw. However, we did have one of our farmers inform us that the field where they harvested, I believe it was Emmer, is where all of their cows were when they were grazing. That was the first field they went to and they really liked grazing that residue down, um, which, is, which is great because that's just added value to the system. So I think as we continue to work with these crops, we're gonna find additional benefits um, for either our cattle or, um, you know, we, I mentioned that we're losing about 60% with those hulls. And so there's been, Dr. Youngquist has been working on using that waste product as either a compost um, or a mulch product or a bedding product. So there's a couple different places that we can potentially find revenue streams for um, the first grains. So Carrie, if there's someone out there listening today or watching it later on YouTube, if they're interested in maybe growing some first grains, could they contact you at CEREC or someone at Sheridan or Powell and come visit and see what you guys are doing? Yeah, and absolutely. Um, so if somebody is interested in growing first grains, um, I would want to have a conversation with them about why? Um, so right now you can't just take the first grains to the elevator like you would with a wheat crop because they don't have the processing capacity for it. Um, so I would, if somebody is interested in growing these, um, I would be more than happy to have a conversation with them, try and give them some insights, and then maybe direct them to some uh, places where they could find a contract um, to produce grain. Okay, so if anybody is interested, um, just let um, me know. We can get you in touch with Carrie and um, maybe start just even if you're curious as to what, what would all be involved. Yeah. We'd be more than happy to help you 
um, get some of those curiosity questions answered and maybe get started on a new adventure in your life. So absolutely. And I don't know when this gets posted, um, if you want to put my contact information with the video, then they could reach out to me that way as well. And that's a technology thing that Aaron has to do. I, I'm not very technology oriented here. So. Well, that's okay. This is my first Facebook Live, so don't feel too bad. <laughs> well, with that, um, if no one has any other questions, um, Carrie does have another meeting she needs to be at. So we will thank her for joining us for today. And um, like we said, if you have questions, Erin will post her information um, and we'll hopefully get them answered for you. So thanks, Carrie. Thank you very much. I hope your spelt banana bread is delicious. It sounds very good. Oh, it will be. It has chocolate chips in it. You can't go wrong. That's so. for sure. You definitely, and it has spelt in it, which makes everything delicious. That's right. Yeah. So it's All right. Thank you. Thanks, Gary. Talk to you later. Bye. Bye. Okay. And as we talked about, we are going to do um, some banana bread made with spelt flour today. And this is a recipe that I've used for now probably two or three years. It was a part of a um, class I taught back in 2018 called Bake the Bag. And it was to promote people using whole wheat flour. And it was um, done by King Arthur Flour. So this is one of their recipes. So it's already been adapted for whole wheat flour. So today we're just gonna substitute the spelt flour in for the whole wheat. And this is really a simple recipe. There's no sifting, there's no, it's all done in one bowl. So that's a good thing. You have a lot less dishes to wash, but it's, it goes together really quickly. So we're just gonna get started with it. And our first step is I've already preheated the oven to 350 degrees. And we're gonna lightly, this spray insists on falling apart every time we use it. Um, we're gonna lightly spray our loaf pan. And this is just a standard uh, nine by five inch loaf pan. And then our next step is in our big bowl, we are gonna start with our mashed bananas. And you want two cups of those. And the recipe said four or five medium bananas will make two cups. Apparently our bananas were a lot littler because it took eight bananas to get to two cups. So we put those first in our bowl. And I always use just a fork to mash them up really good. Um, you can use a potato masher, but a fork is very simple. We are next gonna add our um, half a cup of vegetable oil. Like we have lots of ingredients. And again, when measuring the oil, just make sure you're using a liquid measuring cup and you get down eye level. Um, when we post this recipe, it's going to give you lots of substitution ideas on after the recipe. So if you wanted to make this um, with butter, it will give you the substitution for butter. If you want to make it with less calories, how to substitute in applesauce or yogurt. So there will be some different um, variations you can do with this recipe. So a lot of times it may depend on what you have on hand at home. The next ingredient, which I think really makes this a distinctive banana bread, is we use brown sugar rather than white sugar. And using the brown sugar kind of gives it a more caramelized flavor, a very rich um, flavor. And again, we're using um, light brown sugar rather than dark brown sugar, but you could also use the dark brown sugar. It will just give it a little different flavor with the extra molasses in. 
And that it will also, in the substitution part of the recipe, if you don't have brown sugar or you don't like brown sugar, you can easily substitute just a cup of sugar into the recipe instead of the brown sugar. I just figure you can't go wrong in a recipe that calls for brown sugar. So, this recipe will make this one loaf pan full, or it will make 15 of the larger size muffins. So, you could bake some muffins, share them with your neighbor, um, put those in the freezer and bring them out a little at a time. So, this is a really versatile recipe. Okay, so with this, we're gonna carefully put it into our bowl. And as you can see, it holds its shape, which you want it to. Our next ingredient is two eggs. Again, and our second egg. Now we're going to mix this up really well. And these bananas that we're using today, we used in a different project about two or three weeks ago and had some left over. So we froze them in their peels. And earlier this morning, I got the bananas out and just let them set here on the counter and let them thaw. And um, they came out really, really, they're still, um, they're soft, but they're not the brown, mushy bananas. So. And your batter will be lumpy because of the bananas are lumpy. Okay, next we are going to add our flour, which um, we're going to add one cup of just white all-purpose flour. And again, we just want to kind of Put a little air into that and then spoon it into our cup really gently so that we don't pack it down and get way too much flour in. Um, this is a recipe that you can um, do half um, white flour, half of the whole grain flour, which is that what we're going to do today. If you um, don't have any whole grain flour, you can make it all white flour. And it's also easily converted to 100% whole grain flour. So kind of what, whatever you um, prefer, but today we're going to use some of our um, spelt flour that we ground last week. And it is a pretty, pretty barely tan in color. So it will rise beautifully. Um, spelt is better, better in our breads that we want to rise rather than the emmer. Emmer is um, a better choice for like flatbreads, um, things that don't need to rise here as much. So when we bake our pretzels here in a couple of weeks, we are going to be using the emmer to do those. Okay, and we want a teaspoon of baking soda. A half a teaspoon of baking powder. And at our house, we bake this several different times. Um, I've always just used kind of the half and half with the whole wheat and it turns out beautifully. Um, three quarters of a teaspoon of salt. And again, don't measure this over your bowl because you don't want to get a bunch of extra salt in there.
and a teaspoon of cinnamon. You know what? I just realized I had not put um, the teaspoon of vanilla in. So we'll add that now. We'll add it over here. Okay, so we're gonna mix this up. And again, with a quick bread, such as banana bread, you wanna mix it pretty quickly and not over mix it. And the spelt flour will make it or the whole wheat flour, whichever you're using, will make it a little darker in color as um, does the brown sugar. So. But again, your, your batter will be a little lumpy and just you want to make sure that you have all the flour um, blended in there. And down off the sides. I think if all of you, we are expecting a huge snowstorm to hit here tonight. So tomorrow, if you're having snow in your area, this would be a great recipe to bake up tomorrow. Get your house all warm with the oven going. Okay, now we're just gonna put it into our pan. This will bake anywhere from 60 to 75 minutes. So I always set it at 60 minutes and then you can kind of check in on it and see what it looks like. The top should be nice and brown. If it's getting too brown, you may need to tint it with a uh, tint of aluminum foil. I've never had to do that. Um, usually mine needs to bake about 70 minutes. So don't be surprised. It fills your loaf pan up pretty darn full. And then our last step for this is we mix one tablespoon of sugar. And a half a teaspoon of cinnamon. Make sure I get the right size. And then we're going to sprinkle that on for kind of a little sweet topping that will kind of um, crystallize on the top and be really pretty. And this really is a very simple thing to add to the banana bread, but it is amazing what a kind of crispy, crunchy, sugary crust it gives the top of that banana bread that is amazing. Like it's probably my favorite banana bread recipe because of that little sprinkle of cinnamon and sugar on the top. And we did talk about this. You could have added a cup of mini chocolate chips. You could add a half a cup of nuts, um, chopped pecans, chopped walnuts. Other things you could add are like a cup of dried fruit. These are dried cranberries. Um, those would be excellent in here, or if you like raisins. So you can add, mix and match, and every time you make it, you could make a little different flavor of banana bread. So today we're just doing the normal banana bread without the chocolate, um, but it's by far my favorite with the chocolate. But um, if, if you don't like chocolate, there's a lot of other add-ins you can do. The one thing, um, when you test this for doneness, it said test it with like a paring knife or another really thin blade knife. Put your knife in the center of the loaf and it should come out clean. 
or with a few dried, you know, baked crumbs on it. If there is any um, raw batter on your knife, it is not done. The other thing, if you have a digital thermometer or other type of thermometer, you can use that, stick it in the center, and the center of this loaf, when it is done, should register between 200 and 205 degrees. Most of us don't think about using our thermometers on a baked product, such as your breads or um, cakes, those kind of things, but all of those for optimum doneness should have a certain internal temperature. So with that, we are going to put it in the oven and um, get it baking. And we'll check it in an hour, but I imagine it's going to be about 70 minutes before it is done. So at that point, we will post a picture of what it looks like when it comes out of the oven. And we hope you'll try this recipe. And if you, most of us don't have access to spelt or emmer at home, but with um, good whole wheat flour, I think you'll really like the flavor and the texture. So with that, we will see you next week with the third installment of Baking with Ancient Grains. And to tell you the truth, I can't really remember what we're making next time. So it will be a surprise. So we'll see you next um, Tuesday at 1.30. So have a great week.